I think probably the most important thing about my work has been how multidisciplinary it is I've tried to be. Um, I haven't had kind of one focus in any of the books. They have jumped around uh, across a lot of different fields from neuroscience to the history of chemistry to video games. Um, and I've always tried to build bridges between those different worlds um, and to see those connections uh, and not just uh, kind of focus on a single field. Uh, so that kind of diversity of influence is, is really important to my work. I am working myself on a project about long-term decision making and that has led me decisions that you know have implications and effects that might trickle in five years or a hundred years or five hundred years from now and that has led me to uh, a fascinating project which is trying to decide whether we should uh, actively send a message out to potential other life in other galaxies and what should that message be which is the ultimate long-term decision because you might not get an answer for 25,000 years. And so because of that, I have been reading uh, Carl Sagan's book, Contact, um, which is a, a book about contact with an extraterrestrial life form that was made into a movie. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. I have a neighbor uh, near our place in, in California, the, the, the writer and amazing kind of entrepreneur, I guess, uh, Stuart Brand, uh, who has done so many interesting things. He was one of the founding kind of countercultural hippies. He was a merry prankster back in the day. He started the Whole Earth Catalog, had a huge influence on Steve Jobs, started the first online community, and he's written a number of just terrific books, including uh, the book How Buildings Learn, which is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and talk about someone who just has incredibly eclectic interests. And, uh, you know, in his late 70s, has an incredibly fertile mind. In fact, we went and visited him with my family, my young kids, um, at, at his farm in California, and he was showing us a new drone that he'd gotten and was flying it around, and afterwards my 12-year-old son was like, that's the youngest old person I've ever met. <laughs> and I thought, that's what I, that is my role model. I want to be 78 and have some kids say, that's the youngest old person I've ever met. I've been driven my whole life by the power of curiosity. Um, in fact, one of the things that as a parent I really wanted when my kids were younger, I, I would say about my kids, like, I don't care what they end up doing, I just want to make sure that they're obsessively interested in something, that they just have a great curiosity about the world, about something, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, because that's what I was like as a kid. And, um, I, I didn't necessarily, when I was obsessed with magic or dice baseball games when I was nine, I didn't learn anything directly from that, but that feeling of being infectiously curious about something really sustains me to this day. One of the great passions uh, of my life is that I'm an amateur musician. Um, and there's a whole theme in, in the new book Wonderland about music and the history of musical instruments. So it was great to get to write about music at length for that. But I have a little recording studio and five guitars and a bunch of keyboards and a bass. And, and what, what I love about it is I've probably recorded and performed all the instruments on a hundred songs that I've written over the last 15 years. And maybe nine people have heard any of those recordings, right? It's this thing that I do entirely for myself I have no, there's no thought in the back of my head of one of these days <laughs> I'm actually going to become a pop star. Uh, it's a purely kind of private thing and it's, it's very liberating to have a great passion with no ambition. It's just something you do in this, again, this playful kind of exploratory mode um, because it's interesting and because your curiosity is kind of stoked by it, not because you're trying to achieve something. So that's a great source of happiness for me. Right now, I'm very um, interested in these themes of, of play and curiosity and delight as they apply, to some extent, to work environments, but that's a little bit more of kind of corporate consulting, like changing, which I'm less interested in. I'm more interested in it in terms of what it means for education, right? So what, what do we have to do to change the way that a classroom works so that the natural intellectual energy that is unlocked when one is 
for instance, playing a very complicated game, can be harnessed in some way or channeled so that kids are learning complicated problem solving or they're learning about history or they're learning about science um, through the play mechanism and not through listening to a lecture or memorizing statistics or something like that. And so I think there's a great, and there's a lot of people working on this now, which is good news, but there's a lot of work to be done. And so I'd like to be helpful in that. 